Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Hello. Welcome to a live dev mentoring session. In those sessions, we help students of the Essential Developer Academy to solve any software development problems they are facing. Today, our guest is Austin. Hello. Hey, everyone. Super excited to be here. Thank you for joining us. So for how long have you been a software developer? Yeah, per professionally, I've been doing iOS development the last three years. iOS development and before, have you done any other programming? Uh, yeah, so I went to school for computer science, so I got to touch like a wide, a wide net of different things. So yeah. a little bit of Java, React, .NET, so. Awesome. And the topic today, speeding up CI pipeline. Can you explain a little bit your challenge? Yeah, so um, basically, uh, as I was going through, you know, the lectures um, that we had, one of the topics was CI pipelines. And so I had a side project and I was like, well, uh, I want as I'm uh, going through and building this app, I want to really try and follow that test driven development. Um, and the things that were being taught in the course. Um, and so as I was doing that, I set up um, GitHub Actions to go through and run the tests. Um, and I, I think it makes sense to use Swift Package Managers or CocoaPods um, to you know, get things out to market uh, more quickly. And so as I was using that, I realized how slow that RCI builds were, um, though the tests would run really quickly uh, locally. And so, yeah, I was like, well, that's a problem <laughs> because yes. the longer it takes, the more that we're going to get billed. And if we've got PRs going up like crazy, whether you're doing it, you know, on the side or for a company, um, that's going to rack up a pretty good bill. So, and it's just frustrating. Every commit is another 15 minutes. <laughs> so. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. It seems wasteful, right? Absolutely. Every, every time you push, you, you don't even want to push code, right? It, like, you're afraid of pushing code because... It's going to take 15 minutes. Yeah. OK, so let's have a look here. We have a project on GitHub, GitHub Actions. Yeah, 15 minutes to run the build. Let's think about the process of how um, Xcode fetches the dependencies, right? SPM. Bogdan, you want to share your screen yeah. about this? Yeah. So All I actually right. haven't, uh, like I, I cleaned up the project, uh, the derived data, so we can see in detail what happens on a CI machine when you're trying to open the project for the first time. Uh, this is an important detail of uh, Swift Package Manager. But before we we do that, I, I'd like to take a quick step back and uh, maybe talk about uh, dependency management, especially third party dependency management, just for, for a bit. So we, we have like a, I don't know, uh, a solid basis. Uh, so yeah, we, we get these, we get dependencies we want to integrate in our apps from multiple reasons like business reasons or you want to speed up something uh, and some of them are open source some of them are closed source and historically we used to have no dependency managers uh, and just integrate things manually which mean meant you would get like the sources uh, and drag an Xcode project into your project or uh, some pre-compiled binaries, like a .a. Or you or download it, a zip yeah. with a yeah. bunch of yeah. source code and you just literally drag the files into Xcode. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that was kind of the, the only way you could do it, right? So drag and drop uh, and you'd have to make all the settings, like if a dependency needed some settings, like some compiler flags or some you needed linking to some of the system libraries, you'd have to manually make these adjustments, um, which I, I won't say it's good or bad, but uh, after a while, uh, we started to have these options like 
let's call it dependency managers that could be more like easily to set up and easy to get these dependencies in your in your project so I, if we are going with history uh, as our uh, yeah when, with our um, i don't know uh, direction then we we follow the historical direction then coco pods was the first so quickly about coco pods coco pods is uses a pod file, which is a text file where you specify all your dependencies and you run a command like pod install. And what CocoaPods does behind door is fetches all the sources for these dependencies. Like it resolves the versions and everything, which is more complex. But the simplest thing is it fetches all the sources and puts them in a pods file folder inside your uh, uh, project, project folder. And also creates an Xcode project, uh, which creates the targets for each of these dependencies and links them to your uh, other targets. So then when you make a build of your target, you Im implicitly also build all these dependencies. So that's how CocoaPods does it. There are other ways to integrate it, but like this straightforward way is like this. Then we also uh, have Cartage, which was kind of a, I don't know, different option. It, there was even this debate, like funny debate that one is simple and the other is easy. <laughs> that kind <laughs> of a uh, uh, debate, which was never, uh, I, I think they never uh, got to a result, like which one is better. But Car Cartage, was using a bit of a different approach where you have a cart file. So that's very similar to the pod file, also a text file where you specify dependence, the dependencies. You'd have a resolver like for CocoaPods that would resolve the version you need. But Cartage would fetch the sources in one variant and build them locally and that's it. So you get the pre-compiled binaries locally and then you have to integrate them manually. That's how that's how Cartage works. It there's an option with Cartage to use pre-compiled binaries from the library authors. So if you want to skip the part where you have to build these sources, you can just tell Cartage to use these binaries, and uh, if they are available, especially on, on GitHub. Uh, it will just download uh, the binary associated with the release and uh, you have it locally and then you can go through the same process of manual integration. So you see there's a difference already with like what they, they do. Um, and then Apple and its Swift Package Manager to get to the table, right? So... Swift Package Manager uh, is, can be, be used to build Objective-C as well. So that's important because a lot of people hear the Swift part and say, okay, this is only for Swift. Like, it's not only for Swift. But Swift Package Manager works through the Xcode interface. So there's no file you edit. You go to the interface and Swift Package Manager through Xcode will also fetch the sources, but it will keep them in a like more hidden folder, you won't see them directly. And it will build them once and then cache them locally. So they will not be rebuilt unless you make a change uh, to the version. Like you, you want to upgrade, like get a new version or a different version, that kind of thing. Um, and there's no other change you can make because since they are hidden, you can't make, get in and edit those files. So they are locked. Okay. And this, this is important. Like for, from, a, from a developer point of view, like on a, on a development machine, using Swift Package Manager is where you go in, you open the project for the first time, and all these dependencies are fetched and then built. And you don't have to deal with that again. So they are uh, cached and reused between builds. And it's a smooth experience, I would say. 
Uh, and I, I want to show this. So, uh, Kyle, if you, yeah, switch to yep. my machine back. Thank you. So when I open the project for the first time, you see the package dependencies, they start to, uh, like the spinners start here. Uh, in this case, the project that uh, Austin sent has three dependencies, which are listed here on the package dependencies. So Realm, uh, as the web image and the library for constraints, which is called tiny constraints. And as soon as you open the project, Xcode starts to fetch these behind doors. Uh, and uh, at some point, you're able to build. Yeah, you, like sometimes you get errors like this because there's an extra dependency. So it's not always like the, the smoothest process, but Eventually, yeah, like you see now, they change state. So uh, right now the dependencies were fetched and I can actually build my app. And since this point, I don't have to pay this cost again of fetching or the cost of building, unless, like I said, an upgrade scenario comes in, but let's not talk about that. Now, so the locally, yeah. Yeah, once you fetch the sources locally, you cache that you don't need to fetch every time you yeah. build the project, right? The first time you open the project, it fetches it. As long as you don't update the version, you have that local fetched source code in there. So, yeah. Fetch. You have the cost once. Yeah. So the source files are, are cached and the build is also cached for each of these dependencies. Uh, and as you can see, uh, I'm still building, so it takes a while, especially for the realm uh, target to build, but it will eventually build and I won't have to, to build it again unless I do a clean or no. Uh, but this is on a development machine, right? So I want to take another step back and quickly talk about CIs and CI services and what happens there because it's fundamental to understand why you're getting this cost of 15 minutes per build on a CI machine, which is different. Like you can see in my case, I, I had to, I, I needed 71 seconds to build the project uh, after all the dependencies were fetched. So it's a big difference. Now, why that is, uh, well, First of all, CI machines, uh, CI services initially started with things like Jenkins or GitLab CI, where you would just have regular machines where you would run an agent and then through an interface, you could push some build there uh, that was run on that machine. And at the end, you could get some artifacts, some build results, right? Uh, and it, Oh, they were these machines were almost identical to your dev machines. I mean, dependent on configuration, but you would have caching there. And uh, on on a CI like that, these these Swift package manager dependencies would also be cached because the machine would not be uh, cleaned be between builds. Um, while all these new services like GitHub Actions, Bitrise, Tra Travis, Circle CI, and many more they use virtualization and by virtualization we mean that whenever you you uh, schedule a build the, the ci service will has a pool of uh, virtual machines uh, it picks one machine and it uh, loads a, a clean version of a, an image that contains like the operating system and uh, some version of xcode or multiple versions depending on the, the CI service. So the important thing here is you get a clean machine. So there's no caching, there's no pre-compiled anything. You just get that machine out of the box. It fetches your code from GitHub or another repo, and then build starts. So it's kind of the same, the same process I went to on my local machine the first time when I had to fetch all the Swift Package Manager dependencies and build them, and only then I could actually build my target. Right? So this, this is a very uh, costly process, especially the cost of downloading these dependencies, as you see. So uh, 
by default, all these CI services work like that. So if you don't, it, it's your case, Austin. So uh, if just use it out of the box, you would have to, like every build has to go through these steps, like fetching, downloading the sources, building them for the dependencies, and then uh, linking to and building your project. So that's why it takes 15 minutes. Like if we inspect the logs, we will we will see that it's just regular regular build. Um, so I I took these steps just to understand how uh, how the setup is done and uh, if you're using maybe a different uh, package manager, the situation might be different. It's not necessarily different as as you've seen, but maybe cartridge in some situations uh, goes to the direction of where you, you can use pre-compiled binaries, but we'll talk about that. So they, they act differently and it's important for you and your team to understand this setup you're choosing. So which is the dependency manager I'm using? Which is the CI version I'm using? So how do they work and how do they like work together? And what do I need to do to actually uh, get the most out of it? Right. So uh, and not every CI yeah. service or server will use virtual machines. It depends on the tier you are in, depends how much you're paying them. If you have a dedicated machine or if you're using like a shared pool of machines, they're probably going to use a virtual machine. So, for example, free CI servers like GitHub Actions, in the free tier, you for sure are sharing hardware through virtual machines. So not just you need to fetch and build all dependencies every time, you're also sharing resources with other hundreds of people also running uh, their own services in there, their own jobs, which means even if they have the fastest machine there, it's shared. So you're going to get like not the very good processing time, like network is going to be slow. Everything, imagine like if your machine is super fast, the CI is going to be like, imagine it's 100 times lower. So something that is, takes one minute in your machine is going to take 10 minutes in on CI, let's say. Yeah, it's a it's a good point. So you usually get a, especially with the free services, you get a like a slow machine. Uh, I'm trying to see if I can. No, I, I wanted to to show what's the configuration uh, run by uh, the GitHub Action machine, but it's it's usually like a one one CPU. Uh, and a few gigabytes of RAM. It, it, it's not shown here, but uh, if you if you want to see what they're using, you can inspect these uh, the, their documentation, and they they have a, a clear uh, description of the uh, environments you're gonna get to to build. But they're not very fast, so that's that's another thing to consider, like uh, compared to your dev machine that has like multiple cores and more RAM and uh, caching. Gigabit that, internet. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Be better connection, like all, all that stuff. Um, also, like Kyle said, and th this happens quite a lot. So when you run on these uh, CI machines, sometimes maybe there's on, on the same real machine, there's another heavy build that's being run there. And it takes up more uh, resources so you end up with like high pressure on, on the system you're running. So sometimes you see like big timeouts and uh, like just a degrade of performance. Um, it can happen too. So it has <laughs> its costs, this uh, virtualization on CI. Uh, so yeah, let me know if this, this makes sense so far uh, or you, I don't know, maybe there's something that's, uh, still unclear. Yeah, no, I think that makes uh, a lot more sense. Um, I didn't necessarily take into account um, a bunch of other operations running at the same time. So um, like this idea of, or I guess just the lack of control that we have over like the speed. And so, yeah, I think, you know, the more that we can do overall to decrease that build time in general, like, the better it sounds like yeah yeah that's why yeah. i want to talk about next like what options do we have here i first wanted to 
to go through this more theoretical exercise because it's it's so important. And by the way, <laughs> you only have like four dependencies here. There are a lot of yeah. projects that have 20 or 30 dependencies. Like imagine what's going on there. Um, yep. And at, at least with three package manager, you have to go in and add each dependency in, like individually as with Cocoa Pods, a lot of people used to like just copy paste the pod file with many dependencies from another project and uh, run pod install and get like all these. I might need them. I'm not sure. Like let's keep them at hand kind of approach, uh, which also takes up a lot of build time. So uh, yeah, it's like this. If you b actually build the code you wrote, maybe it takes thirty seconds, but adding the dependencies, a code that you didn't write, maybe it takes. 15 minutes, right? So yeah. one thing is minimizing dependencies. I think that's already clear. Doesn't mean you shouldn't use dependencies, but there are strategies when you need to use dependencies, but removing any dependency that you don't need it because sometimes there's these huge libraries and you need like one function inside of it, but you still need to build the whole <laughs> yeah. dependency, the whole binary in there, you know. Realm's a great all example the source code. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah, Realm is probably this the slowest to build in the, your list. It's a huge it yeah. uh, package. It is. OK, so um, let's, let's see what options we have here to make this worse or better. <laughs> oh, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, so one option would be to uh, use one of the pre-built GitHub Actions, uh, which is called cache. Uh, but this is an option that is limited to GitHub Actions only. So if you will ever go to another CI service, you have to see how they do caching and adapt the solution. Uh, this is a pretty simple action that comes with GitHub Actions. Uh, and uh, I can ju jump to the, they have a dedicated documentation section about Swift package manager and Swift. So I'll jump to that. Um, generally what this does is it can cache any artifact in your build using a key. It will be stored somewhere in the GitHub actions, uh, like on their servers. And future builds using the exact same key can access those cached results and use them. You know? So that's that's how it works. And maybe it's uh, if you mention you work with Java, it's similar to Maven uh, in that way, where you can store um, some artifacts on a on a server and uh, get them in the same variant. Um, from maybe another machine or something like that. So let's talk about this solution as a as a solution, not just as the GitHub action step, but one solution to this problem is caching the dependencies, right? You cache the dependencies in the CI server, so you don't need to fetch and build them every time. Since the dependencies are usually stable, you readily update them. Right, they are stable. You can cache them. Yeah. So that's one solution. Cache them in the CI server. So in the builds, like you already fetched it and already built it. So you don't need to do it again. Yeah. Is it keeping track of versions then too? Yeah. At that point? Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll explain to you just, just in a second. So it makes more sense. Um, but th this is the principle, right? So caching, like you, you want to avoid making this extra extra cost of fetching and hopefully the cost of building. So in this example, uh, with Swift Package Manager, you have a, you define a key that just uses a hash. It's a hash algorithm for that can hash a text file. And this text file would be the package.resolved uh, file so i i see from the look on your face that you know what this file does but for maybe other people that are uh, watching this so 
when Swift Package Manager resolves dependencies, it creates this package.resolve file. And I'll, I'll try to uh, show it while we, uh, we talk. Uh, where it's basically a text file that contains the um, resolved dependencies, their version, their like the re source they were uh, downloaded from. So uh, I'll do this. I'll open the package contents of the Xcode project because we only have an Xcode project and inside the workspace. So again, show package content. Uh, we have an XC shared data folder and inside it, there's a Swift PM folder. And here we have this package.resolved. Sorry, let me open this with Xcode. And like I said, it's a it's a text file where all these dependencies are like in JSON format. Say like the name of the package, the URL, the state, like which branch, which revision, the version, um, and it contains all the dependencies. Right. So basically, this file is like a snapshot of all the dependencies that were installed at this one point. Right. So that's why using a hash of this file will guarantee that if nothing changes to these versions and to the list of dependencies in their order, I can use the cache. That's what I want to do. And when there's any change, like if there's a new version, a new revision, uh, like a change in a package name, maybe if that's possible, uh, I want to invalidate that cache and re redo the process because something has changed. And there's no way to granularly determine uh, what changed. So you want to just throw away that cache and do it again. So uh, back to how this action is set up. So uh, the key is, like I said, calculated using a hash of this file. And I need a path to some far files, to some artifacts. And in this case, I'm going to use the dot build, which is actually the build folder inside your project where Swift Package Manager outputs all the all the binaries and the intermediate files and everything. So uh, I just like the, the cache uh, action will get all the contents of this folder from one build and uh, store them somewhere under this key. So the next time a, a build starts, using this uh, cache action, if I have the exact same hash uh, or key, then uh, I can just use those. And uh, the action will download these files, bring them locally on my machine in the exact same folder. So uh, from the Swift package manager's point of view, it's like on a local machine where you've already done this before. So it said, okay, I know I don't need to build the, these again because they're already built. Like the folder is there or the dependencies are built so I can just use them. So that's, that's one way to, to uh, avoid paying this uh, fetch and build cost. Okay. And uh, th this is not something, uh, I don't know, strict for Swift as GitHub Actions can run on, I don't know, any other languages, other environments. Uh, it can cache anything, almost anything. So uh, you also have here like a variant for CocoaPods or for Cartage, like um, pretty, it's pretty powerful. Rust, Scala. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's not just limited to GitHub Actions. Every CI has some kind of caching mechanism. Hmm. So specifically with CocoaPods, um, I know it, I see that it caches the pod lock or pod file dot lock. Um, I know it's not super uncommon across team members for that to get out of sync. Is there a specific way to manage that? Well, and maybe I'm like asking that incorrectly. I just know, um, yeah cross teams, somebody will make a commit, um, you'll pull those changes, though nothing changed 
um, in the necessarily like with the pods, for some reason, the pod lock has like changed or like slightly been modified. I don't know if it's a machine thing or something else, um, forcing mm -hmm. you to rod pod, pod install again. <laughs> this is usually okay. when you have a permissive versioning for the, your dependencies. For example, when you use the, let me share maybe here. You know, when you say, oh, I want library eWeb image version, like, I don't know, any version like 1.2, for example, which allows 1.1, 1.2, 1.3. Mm. So if you use like specific version, no, I want 1.2.3. It's less likely that someone building the project again will auto update to a new version. Uh, but if you use like a, oh, any version, I don't know exactly the syntax, but you know what I mean, right? That yep, that makes sense. It's like a more permissive, like but X, for example, like any 1.2, which means that maybe you built 1.2.1, but when your colleague was building his project, there was a new update and his version is 0.2 now. And then every time you commit to like, you know, there's all this blob of code plus a <laughs> lock file in the middle of the commit. So okay. using less permissive versions, no, specifically 1.2.1 and that's it. I will go there manually and update it when I'm happy yeah. to update my yeah. my dependencies. We'll generate a more stable pod file or even a more stable uh, SPM package resolved file or a cartridge as well uh, resolved file. It's just understanding the concept, the concept of like, you want a stable key for your cache, right? And usually, one stable key is the, the manifest file that describes what are my dependencies and which versions I'm using. And as the more stable you make this file, the more stable will be your cache. Otherwise, you're always invalidating the cache, which means having a cache is not helping you at all. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. This is a very important topic. I'm, I'm glad Kyle brought this up because if you if you use any anything less than strict, like any version that kind of satisfies multiple versions or so specifier, like uh, I, I can accept every, every like 1.2.x or even more is brings in a risk because you, you or, and your colleague might have different versions of the same library or even worse when you do the testing with one version and by the time you get to i don't know archive and submit there's a new version available and you submit with that untested version which may just break <laughs> your code so that i think and, and a lot of people have actually uh, experienced issues like this uh, that's why it's very very like a very safe strategy to lock these versions and CocoPost tries tries to do that with the that that's why you get the pod file dot lock. Uh, it tries to lock on the versions. So unless you do a pod upgrade, which is a different command, you will still have always the same uh, the same versions. But there's a catch, and that might be another cause why you mentioned the problem of the pod file dot lock changing is. Every time you run a command like pod install, pod upgrade, the hash in the pod file.log changes. So it gets regenerated every time. So even if nothing changed, like I run a pod install, all the versions are the same, all the dependencies are the same, I still have a, a different hash. So the file is different. So sometimes that leads to conflicts where I check in that and my colleagues checks in the same, or maybe he, he has done some, some changes and there, boom, there's a conflict because that line with the hash cannot be resolved by Git in this case. So that's where you have to throw this away. What I recommend in these situations is all the files that can be regenerated, like the pod file lock, the uh, pods Xcode project, uh, you can just reset them and redo the command and regenerate them whenever you have a conflict. So instead of trying to manually fix this, just reset and uh, regenerate and you should be fine. Right. Yeah, this so. is something you need to talk to your team and say, hey, if nothing changed in the dependencies and there's just like a hash change in the pod file, 
do not commit it. Do not commit because yeah. this will invalidate our CI caches. You know, there'll be a cost for that. Or you find another way of having a, a key as well in the CI server. <laughs> but usually, like when I work in a team, like I, I try to put this culture of like when you commit something, check what you're committing because it's very common that people come and say, you know what, git commit dash am, I'm done. <laughs> you know, and like in everything that is in there will be added. Yeah. Odd files, like things that are not like, you know, like they shouldn't be there yeah. in one big commit. So this culture, like actually when you commit, like look at the files you're committing, make sure they're creating like concise commits, separate things. If you have like 10 changes in your stage, Maybe commit like, oh, these two files are independent. So I'm going to create the independent commit here. Oh, this pod file shouldn't have changed. Reset, you know? And changes to the. It makes the, project. the history yeah. healthier. And have also benefits as well, like more stable caches, right? Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. So. Uh... We, we talked about caching at the CI level. So how can we get our CI service to do the caching? We can, we can do the caching on our own in the repo. So uh, basically where I'm going is we can use pre-compiled binaries. Um, and a good example of that is whenever you get a closed source or like a private private source uh, framework or library you you don't get the files you get just the binary right um, it's the case with with many dependencies i think uh, crash Lytics used to be like that firebase there are, there are, right? yeah firebase and, uh, google analytics and more like they just give you a, a binary so you you can do that as well uh, because like i have said Let's take SD web image because we know it. Uh, it doesn't change that often, and you want to control when it when you upgrade it. So you don't really need to rebuild it every time just in case it changed. It didn't change, like you know it it should not change. And to make a short parenthesis, because I forgot to mention this, like for for instance on CocoPods, there's a pod uh, outdated command that will show you all the pods that have newer versions. So you just run that locally and say, OK, there's a new version of CocoaPod or of, uh, SD Web image. And I will look into the release notes. And if it fits my uh, project, then I can make the, the upgrade. But I'm not forced to, you know, like, uh, trying to, to lock in on these dependencies. Just made that comment. So back to, to uh, using pre-compiled binaries. Um, Again, like if you know these dependencies are not going to change that often, then why not cache them? Uh, at the project so, level, right? Yeah, at the project level, at the repo level. Um, so let's talk about the, the package managers we, we mentioned and see how, how it can, if you can achieve this with, with them. And then we'll talk about doing it manually because that's always an option, right? So... First of all, with Cartage, like I said, you can, if if that dependency supports uh, uh, the pre precompiled binaries, then you can just uh, ask Cartage to use that. Uh, I think it's to a parameter to the uh, bootstrap command where you say use binaries or something like that. And it would just download the precompiled binary and that's it. You have it locally, you add it to your source control and you just need to integrate it. Yeah, so uh, this we, is important. Yeah, I, I think we need to explain, like, when using Cartage, for example, you, you fetch the sources locally, and then you build them, and you add the pre-compiled binary that is the result of this build into your project, and you can also add it to your repository. You will commit the pre-compiled binary. So, if your colleague fetches that your changes into their machine, they will not have to build. Like they're gonna use this pre-compiled binary in there. 
which means your CI as well, when it clones your repository, it will not have to compile that dependency as well. Yeah. Yeah. You compile it once and use it all over the place uh, like that. And if somebody needs to do an upgrade, then they recompile it and override the version in the repository. And that should be it. Uh, Okay. Which is different than Cocoa Pods, right? Yeah, it's different than Cocoa Pods because Cocoa Pods has some mechanisms to do this. But you, first of all, you need the you need to use some Cocoa Pods plugin, and all the plugins that do this, and I, I will not mention them because none of them are maintained at this mo point. So they might work, they might not work for your situation. It's kind of a <laughs> open water situation where you're on your own. So uh, it's harder to do, but uh, it might be done even with, uh, with Cocoa Pods. Work sometimes. Yeah. And for Swift Package Manager, Apple also built the ability to distribute bi like pre-compiled binaries through Swift Package Manager, but it's up to the uh, author of the library to make that available. So they have to include it in the package.swift uh, file as a as a binary, and then you can print the the binary. Uh, so again, not a lot of projects like open source project have that. Uh, support so you can't really use it because you cannot override that file for them so you're kind of limited and from what you can see here cartridge is the only way that kind of uh <laughs> yeah i don't know is is better suited to to accommodate this but what we can look into is the option to do the integration manually because if you just have a few dependencies or you have dependencies that you don't plan to, I don't know, change a lot, maybe for your case, it's better just to do it like we do it in the old days, like manually. Yeah. You know, uh, sometimes we get absorbed of like, what's your uh, package manager and how are you going to use it? And you forget that there's an option to do things simply, like to uh, just plain old integration so drag and drop <laughs> yeah and i i want to try to do that uh with maybe sd web image and see how how that goes uh, i think it's a it's a good exercise so what we what we had so far was uh like i was able to build with the Swift package manager dependencies. And of course, like my build took 70 seconds. If I build it again, it will be pretty fast, like two seconds, okay? Because everything is pre-cached, pre-built, like there's no there's no changes. Um, but- uh, So locally yeah, for, it works fine, you yeah. know, but the problem is on CI because CI you would have to do it every time. Yeah. So, Let's see how I would do this manually. So if I uh, right click on SDWAM image and I use show in finder, first of all, uh, this is where the source files get downloaded. So it's inside the derived data, your project, and there's a source packages, checkouts, uh, folders, and then each dependency has its own folder. So in my case, it's SDWAM image. And that's the that's the project. So I can I can open the uh, Xcode project. And uh, let me try to to build it. So I'll use this target. And uh, I want to build it for iOS, right? Simulator. Yeah, simulator. I think it. I was using the iPod Touch Seven. So 
the, all the messages you see are from uh, <laughs> Swift Package Manager that uh, makes sure nobody changes these checkout versions. So uh, they they are locked. Okay, but now we have a we have a a, a built version which is for simulator. So for a device, uh, you would have to, like ideally you, you would build all the architectures um, for, for that uh, target for SD web image because you don't know up hand which, which architecture you're gonna use. So uh, you need to have a binary that contains like a simulator and the devices you support, like all these all these slices. Um, I probably it's going to take too long to to do that, but uh, let me get to the build folder, and now I have the SD Web Image framework here, and I'll just close this one and. Uh, Inside our project, I should be able to. Okay, there's no frameworks, but I'll just drag and drop as the web image. I'll put it here. Are you should... ready to do the test? <laughs> yeah. Now I think it's on root. Okay, so there's the binary and I just need to remove it from the package. So I, I want to remove the Swift package manager integration and uh, through build phases, like on my Matt Pro target here, I wanna, I wanna link it, so. It should be here. Let me see if I, yeah. So uh, the problem is when I copied first in the test folder and then did another copy, uh, it didn't copy the target membership, so it's not included. So I need to make sure that my framework is added to the target. And now it's like you see automatically linked uh, here. So I'll, I'll do a build. Hopefully it will work. That's how we used to do back yeah. in the day before yeah. <laughs> dependency managers. So now uh, I can actually, I probably skipped a step because I should have copied this uh, build folder, like the, the framework folder inside uh, our repository. So oh, it's automatically copied by Xcode. Thank you, Xcode, for this. Because I wanted to add it to source control, right? So uh, right now it's on the root. Usually you would put it in a, I don't know, frameworks folder or something, but uh, it's it's an example. It, it, it's not a full solution, like I said. You need to make a tweak to to uh, build all the all the architectures at once, so you have them when you when you uh, are building different uh, architectures uh, for your um, target. But um, that's also if it's a debug or release build, yeah. right? Change the configuration. Yeah. So it's more work. That that's the point. Like it's more work, so you only want to do it when you have a stable dependency that you're not going to be updating all the time. So you do it once and you get the benefits of having it there available to you. So um, when you're going through and doing that, is it just a matter of building it for the different simulators and it adds what it needs to inside um, the folder? Where you originally pulled the framework out, or no, the, or are you all the simulators the have the same architecture? Got it. Okay. So it, it's not the, the 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 problem is if you just build for simulator and then try to link it 
uh, I, I won't be able because I to to build for device. But if I had like the certificates and all, and I try to do a device build right now, the symbols mm -hmm. in this framework would not include the symbols for the device. And the device is a different architecture. It's usually like ARM64 or ARM V7S. Uh, and the simulator, which is run on a Mac, uh, has a different architecture. Like It can be ARM64, but it's a different one if it's the new M1. Or mm. uh, I think the other ones, uh, i38, like x86 or uh, there's another one with 64 bit i can't remember that one but they are all different that's that's the point here so um, you have to have all these uh, different uh, slices with with their corresponding symbols to be able to link otherwise the linker will say i cannot find this symbol it doesn't exist for me because it's in a different architecture got it so it's not a matter of you having to drop necessarily two separate like frameworks into the project it's just compiling it and then adding the yeah. symbols and then dropping yeah. it into the project okay that makes sense yeah yeah and uh yeah i mean if if we i wanted to go through this like maybe final uh solution because it's you can see it's not an easy one maybe it's hard to maintain these to make these tweaks like uh is the web images easy to install other uh, maybe realm needs i don't know how many configurations you have to go in and make manually so it's not easy um, but it's a it's good to know this option as well and to weigh it in with with the others so i think if we look at the ones we went through it's probably easiest for you to try to use that github actions cache if you are committed to github uh, actions yeah. for now right so that would kind of be an approach where you do it once for all your dependencies. Um, yeah. In this case, it, the complexity increases with with the number of dependencies you have. So uh, yeah. it might not scale well. There's another problem with doing the CI caching is you don't know for how long they will keep that cache. Is it a long-lived cache? Is it a short-lived cache in the free tier? If you're paying, how what is the cost of keeping like gigabytes of caches in there and having a process to clean the caches as well so you're not paying for storage that you're not using. You know, ev everything has the like, pros and cons, right? Like setting up the cache on CI is probably the easiest one to get right now, but it depends like how, how many times they recycle that cache because if you, if you build like three times a day, but the cache only leaves 25 minutes and you build like every three hours, Having a cache there is not going to change anything because every time you run a build, the cache is gone, right? Yeah. So you need to take this into consideration. And then if that's the case and you want, don't want to pay for a tier where you have long-lived cache or more dedicated hardware, then you think, okay, so I'm going to then use pre-compiled binaries that is already checked in in my repository. And then my, my, my CI pipeline will get will clone the repository with all the binaries ready yeah and if you if you need that extra control to maybe control the way you do upgrades and all you can look into cartage which is kind of doing the same thing but uh through the cart file so that you have you still have to do the manual integrations but for instance cart cartage will know how to how to build with all the architectures included in as these binaries, you know, that kind of a thing. Right? You generate the debug symbols and there are a few uh, details there which which matter. So, yeah, take all these into We've got account. a good comment about Cartage here. That it doesn't have support. A lot of libraries don't support it, right? Yeah. <laughs> which is a problem yeah. as well. Yeah. And it's really hard to add. I mean, it's almost impossible because Cartage relies on sharing the Xcode project and the scheme of your target to be added to GitHub. So Cartage can pick that up. So if the author did not share these files, there's no way you can you can do it. Like you can try to fork the repo or something, but it's it, it gets really complicated. 
at least with cocoa pods, like if we talk about these differences with cocoa pods, even if they miss the pods back, because that's how you add uh, support for cocoa pods to a to a framework, uh, you can add it to I don't know locally on your machine or to a, a another spec repository that you can create. So there's an option to come in and add support for CocoaPods to a library that's not done be, by the author, by, but by a third party. Whereas with Cartage, it's, if the author has that uh, support, fine. Otherwise, there's not a lot of room to maneuver. No, so yeah, uh, pros and cons. Yeah, so CocoaPods, it's hard to get pre-compiled binaries and SPM as well. Only if the authors actually did the work, you know, <laughs> you get a pre-compiled binary. So if you're dealing with closed source projects, dependencies, for sure you get the pre-compiled binary because it's the only way you get their code because you don't have access to the code. Cartage is already like every dependency that supports Cartage, you get the pre-compiled binaries, but support is limited. Like the vast majority of Libraries will support CocoaPods and SPM. A few will support Cartage. If you are the lucky one that the libraries you're using support Cartage, maybe that's a solution for you. And trust me, I, I was involved in maintaining some of these open source projects. It's really hard for a maintainer to, with every release, to assure all these uh, integration methods are supported and up to date and uh, everything works out. So sometimes people just remove them. So there's a lot of libraries out there which had cartridge support. And at some point, the guy said, okay, I'm not going do doing this for every version. Like I, I pick one, the, and they usually pick Swift Package Manager because it's from Apple and say, okay, for everything else, you can do it on your own or something like that, you know? So Good luck. Uh, <laughs> even the situation can change during time. Uh, it's something to consider. But from, like, if I can share my experience, like, I've used GitHub Actions with this cache action for a while now, and the cache is live pretty pretty long time so i would say almost a month or more um, and i never saw uh, invalidations that were i don't know triggered by the system somehow so it, it was it worked really well for for me in a couple of projects where i use this approach i i was using co coco pods and caching based on the hash of the pod file dot lock as you as you uh, mentioned earlier so that went pretty smoothly, but of course that can change as well. So, uh... Yeah, so that's why it's important to understand the principles behind all those solutions, because then when there's a change on CI, you know what's going on. Because like maybe you start using this cache approach and it's pretty good. And then like next week they make a change on their plans and like, no, we're not going to have long lived caches anymore unless you pay for it. And suddenly you just see a drop in your, in your CI like speed and you're like, what is going on? And you'll be able to check the logs and say, oh, I'm building all the time. So the cache is not working for me anymore. Or it's not caching as much. So, And then you have all the solutions, right? Start with the simplest one. and But know that when that stops working for you, there are other more manual like <laughs> things you need to do. Like Cartage is easier probably than doing everything manually. But it still has some manual steps here because it fetches and builds them for you, and then you need to link the binaries manually. But at least the fetching and building is done by the the tool for you, right? Yeah. And if it doesn't work for you, the library doesn't want support, you need to know that you can always do everything manually. Like it's just <laughs> cumbersome, but can be done. Everything Indeed. you can do with those dependency managers, you can do manually. There's a there's another dimension here which I will only mention because I don't want to get another hour out of this. Uh, so we talked about those different solutions, like different different managers. Now there's different ways people use them in their projects. So for instance, on CocoaPods, there are people who just keep a copy of the pod file and do pod install every time, or there's 
I, I think most people will keep the contents of the pods uh, sources into their repository. So an, again, another variation. And I, I, I went back to this thought because Kyle mentioned these cartridge uh, pre-compiled binaries. Well, I once ramped up on a project where they had a they had a cartridge and just a card file. And that's it. And <laughs> all the builds like on a CI or on a dev machine had to do the bootstrap. So download, build, like in your very similar to what's happening in your case with Swift package manager. So if you're not adding them to your repository, then <laughs> you're paying that cost every time. So again, a difference, like the tool is the same, but, but the way you you integrated in your flow is different. So again, another dimension or variation that can can impact the the way you use them. So I guess my my advice is just track builds over time. Uh, be be careful about that. Pay attention, and whenever you see something like this, when okay, I got a fifteen minute build, just go in, check the log, see what's happening there. If you can isolate the problem, is it on old machines? Is just CI maybe, uh, and see what's going on. And that way, you avoid having at some point maybe a one-hour build or worse, as we all saw probably sometimes. Uh, that's it. So I think it's understanding that there are two steps that if we can eliminate them, we'll speed things up. One is fetching the dependencies, and the second one is building the dependencies. If you can eliminate both, that's great. If you can eliminate at least one, you know, you already move, make things faster. So if you're using CocoaPods, for example, one way of eliminating these fetches sources, which can take a lot of time. Sometimes when you run pod install the first time, it takes like 10 minutes, you know, <laughs> just to fetch all the dependencies. And one way of doing that is tracking the pod file in your Git history. Now, this is a controversial matter because there are people that would say, no, you should never do that. But it's like, no, it's a case by case. We know we're doing this for a reason because you want to avoid fetching things all the time. Right. Right. So fetching and building, if you can eliminate both, perfect. If you can eliminate at least one, even better. Well, not even better, but yeah. it's not as worse. <laughs> and all the problem comes from VCI services where you're using virtual machines and every run is in a clean state. It's like a clean machine, you know, with no history of happened before, unless you cache it and then you get the history back, right? But if you run your own machine, which is another approach as well, you know, you can have your own CI. I used to do this back in the day, like Mac minis and everyone would have their own machines and and then you have control of what is there, what are the dependencies that are cached. And, but as soon as you start using a CI server that is using virtual machines, that every run is a clean machine, then you have this new problem. You know, like every solution has their own problems. Managing your own hardware also has its problems. <laughs> Everything can be done manually. Does it answer your questions about the topic? Do you have any other questions? Uh, no, I think that was like a, a super great job of just breaking everything down. It gives me a good idea of where to start next. I think that's, I think that the most important thing uh, that I got from this. Um, so yeah, that was helpful. Awesome. awesome. All right. So if you have any questions, you can ask on Slack and always welcome to come back. It was great talking to you. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Kyle. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us, Austin. Bye. See ya. Take care. Mm -hmm.